Now to the main event, Virel Popescu. He's here. I've forgotten his title, and he doesn't have a title slide. Therefore, it's all for you, man. It's all your tribe. <laughs> Thank you, uh -huh. guys. There it is. I did have a title slide. Conservation and Changing World. <clears throat> All right. Um, well, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Uh, it's really pretty outside, by the way. Uh, it snows very nicely. Uh, thank you, the organizers, for uh, inviting me to, uh, to talk about what I love. So it should be fun tonight. Um, so Conservation in a Changing World, right? So it's the broader title, the broadest title I could think of just because I really wanted to invite uh, questions. Uh, so I'm a conservation biologist. I teach a conservation biology class in biological sciences. Um, and I know that everyone is here for the bobcat pictures. Um, that's right. We, that'll, that'll have to wait a little bit. Uh, we will talk about bobcats, uh, about the real Ohio bobcats. Uh, but first, I'd really like to, to talk about uh, what do you do as a conservation biologist or a conservationist, okay? And for that, I'm also, you know, I'm gonna probably call or name my students here um, to pitch in once in a while uh, or just say hi. <laughs> uh, so the idea for, to, to, for tonight is really to have, really have a conversation. Uh, I will showcase, you know, uh, some of the things that we do in the lab, including the bobcats, but, and I, would, I will invite questions all throughout the, um, um, uh, th throughout, throughout this next hour. All right, so um, conservation in a changing world, right? So because this is a conversation, let's go back to this, okay? And actually, I have a question for you, right? Because I, really, I was thinking hard about how do you introduce something that's so broad, right? So what I want to ask you, it's like, if I say conservation biology or conservation, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Come to your mind, just spit it out. Yes. Resources, okay. Natural resources. Recycling, okay. Forests. The zoo, okay. Endangered species. Protection. Too many people, right. Uh, all right, so, uh, so Right, so, so conservation. So you guys touched on a lot of, of things that kind of that go into what conservation really is and what makes this field very exciting and very hard to grasp, right, and actually get to the you know, a right answer. And, right, so you mentioned dangerous species, so we talk about species. So species is the currency, right, the, in conservation. Now we talk, talk about, uh, you know, endangered frogs, we talk about pandas, we talk about bears, we talk about bobcats, right? So those are the, you know, what we really care about. We also talk about people, right? So whether those species are endangered or if they're doing well, it's sometimes because of what we do, I mean, most of the time is of what we do, but how we look at those species, it's about the perception of the society, right? So some people like to use the species for viewing. <laughs> Some people like to use the same species for, you know, meat, right? So society plays a huge part. Economics, because, you know, we're talking about society, right? We're always going to have rules and policies, right? In the New Species Act, you know, all sort of, all sort of uh, important policies. But also economics, right? We always have to keep an eye on how people are doing, right? Like if the people are not happy <laughs> and people don't have food for tomorrow, they will not really care about conservation, right? So, um, so with that, you know, I'm here to talk about, you know, science, conservation science, and what, and then what we're doing here in the, um, like at OU in, uh, in, in our lab. But to do science, you really, really have to really step outside your comfort zone, right? You really have to understand what the society wants, right? What are the stakeholders, right? What are the, those people that really care about your species and your science, if there are any of them out there, um, right? You really, know, you need to be aware about you know, what policy is, where, where, you know, where it's been, where it's going to, especially nowadays. It's really important to keep an eye out on what's going on, right? What, what's the next thing that's gonna be gutted, maybe? Uh, and of course, you know, keeping an eye on, on the economics of protecting species, for example, or making uh, 
like be better livelihoods equals conservation, right? Um, so because of that, nothing, none of this really matters <laughs> in the end, right? If you don't really communicate this, right? So you do your science, great. And then you really, you know, if you want people to care and if you want to affect change, you really have to be able to communicate it, right? You have to be able to take your high-level science published in Science and Nature and PNAS or whatever and really explain it to a, you know, second grader, <laughs> to, uh, to a freshman, to anybody, right? To the general public. So, and what we do, we really strive to really, you know, take, take our science and I uh, always encourage all my students to really go out there and like, <laughs> talk about it, regardless, <laughs> to, uh, uh, regardless of anything, right? So communication is super important. Um, do you guys have anything to add? If I forgot anything about what conservation is, uh, you know, it's, it's something I've, and you mentioned sustainability, right? Sustainability ties in, right? Somebody said sustainability there and ties into everything. Here, right? um, all right, so uh, like I said, uh, we're just going to be talking, you know, questions can come from about like any conservation issues that, you know, Ohio or anything that you care about. Uh, but um, before, like during that time, I'm also going to talk about some of the stuff that we're doing in this, in the lab, right? So, um, so what, what my students here, my trustworthy <laughs> graduate students uh, and I are working, on, are working on. So this is just a word cloud of all the abstracts and all the you know, kind of the papers, uh, conference proceedings and everything that uh, we published in the past many years, right? So uh, I'm, by training, I'm a wildlife ecologist, right? So I'm a quantitative wildlife ecologist. I do a lot of things with numbers and I do a lot of things out in the field, right? So we study populations of animals, right? And we'll talk about what animals we're studying, right? And most importantly, the population and the, the species and the, the populations and their relations with their, with their environment, right? We really, not re really need to understand how the environment affects how populations, uh, and especially the human impact on the environment and on their habitat and their impact uh, on, on the populations. We really care about conservation. So uh, one of the, 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 re the re re recurring themes in this work is, you know, it has to have, and this is the first thing I actually tell, when a, when, a, when a potential graduate student comes in and sits in front of, on the other side of the desk, it's like, no, what you're going to do here has to, have or has to have immediate conservation or management applications, right? So we care about, you know, we do the science, we do the hardcore science, has to, you know, this has to happen, this is the process, but you have to be able to take that and do something with it ASAP because the world's in crisis, as you all know. <laughs> so we, unless, you know, you do something with it right away, May, you know, things can, can get lost, right? So we do a lot of de management. So, you know, trying to quantify populations, you know, abundances of animals, you know, how they, you know, how they select the resources in, in their environment. Uh, do a lot of energy work as well, uh, you know, trying to look at renewable energies and how different energies can uh, um, um, overlap with places that we care about uh, protecting. Um, and we do a lot of stuff on amphibians, her, uh, reptiles, and carnivores. So it just kind of just happened <laughs> that this is the this is the uh, this is what um, sort of the, st the study taxa. Okay. So um, <clears throat> let me think. All right. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what um, what kind of projects uh, we're doing in the lab, and please stop me and ask me about I'm not going to give you too many details just because I wanted to ask stuff <laughs> okay um, and you'll see that it, it really ties into most of the stuff that you said you know it, it is about sustainability uh, it's about forests so we do a lot of work in forest ecosystems um, it is about uh, we don't really deal with population <laughs> of overpopulation of people I mean uh, but it that is an integral part of of a lot of the research uh, especially with bobcats, you know, because I'll talk a little bit about bobcats like to cross roads, apparently. There's many roads, too many people, too many cars, right? Um, so, uh, <laughs> obviously the question that everybody has been asking over and over again, you know, and kept you up at night, 
right? Oh yeah, so this is, what, this is one of the things that I really wanted to, to actually dwell in before I get in this. Uh, I had, actually had a note and I forgot it. Uh, about keeping you up at night, right? So, uh, you know, framework conservation, it's cool, go to handle animals, you can, do, you can really do neat things in the out outdoors, you know, ticks everywhere and all that. Um, but you re it really has to be something, you know, it has to be a topic, and this is why uh, my students here are, are, are great, you know, because they really care, they really work on things that, you know, basically keep them up at night, right? So you've got to answer, you know, so not, right? So I'm not talking about student loans, <laughs> right? Or the next exam or anything like that. Uh, I'm really talking about things that you really deeply care, you know, it might, might be an organism or a topic or something that it's really close to your heart. And then this is why you want to work in conservation, right? And it's not, it's not because you want to make big bucks, let's put it that way, because you're not. <laughs> um, so uh, again, going back to the question that keeps you up at night, why did the turtle cross the road? Uh, Marcel here, oh, say hi. All right, so she, so, um, <clears throat> She's doing a master's, a master's, a master's project on uh, box, eastern, bo eastern box turtles on the, uh, on the Nelsonville, uh, Nelsonville bypass. And as you see, there's a, so there's a rec uh, the other recurring, th recurring theme throughout this work is that, you know, there's to be, you know, the, you know, a question or a threat to a population to, or to a species, you know, and then, you know, you ask the right question. And then you go and scramble into whatever your science is. And then you have to come up with that solution, or actually a range of solutions that you think might actually take care of the, of, the, of the issue, right? So in this case, what's the issue? Well, issues are the roads, right? We're turtles, and they move slowly, right? So uh, one of the most, most pervasive uh, threats to turtle populations in the United States, at least, is road mortality, right? The roads. So in Marcel, uh, so this is Ryan, Ryan Wagner, who took these amazing pictures, and uh, he's somewhere back there, uh, a trustworthy uh, uh, undergraduate researcher. Um, so they went out and asked, how does the new bypass impact the turtle population that used to live there in Wayne National Forest? As you know, like this new bypass came in, kind of a naive uh, population of turtles, right? So the idea was that, okay, well, let's study turtles here next to the bypass. Let's study turtles somewhere far away from roads to see how they do in their, without any sort of road impact. And then look at how they select habitats, you know, how they move, and most importantly, if they're stressed out, right? So, uh, so Marcel's been using all these really cool techniques to figure out stress, chronic stress in turtles. So what do you think the question to that is, the answer to that question is? Why did the turtle cross the road? To get to the other side. Get to the other side. In this case, they didn't cross the road, apparently. So this is a really cool finding that of Marcel's, is that uh, you have all these turtles with little transmitters on them, right? So Marcel and Ryan pretty much went all over the entire summer um, and tracked them every single day, kind of measured my habitats and all this kind of stuff. And they found that lots of turtles were basically Within, from, uh, within like five, six feet from the highway, right, from the pavement for a week, two weeks, and they never attempted to actually cross that highway, right? So, which is kind of unexpected, because we were like, oh my God, we're gonna, we're gonna tag all these turtles right to the highway, and then in two weeks, it's gonna be, you know, disaster. And nothing, nobody actually did that, right? So now, we're, now there are new questions, like why didn't they cross the road, right? Is it, is it too much traffic? Is it, you know, so there's a whole bunch of unknowns there that uh, we still have to answer. Um, have any questions about roads and turtles in general or other things? <laughs> yes, Roxanne. So, okay, there, when it rains, I see a lot of turtles and mm -hmm. This particular right. Uh, it's it's you're right. It, it is a common species, but in Ohio, it is a species of concern. Right? It's listed. 
uh, by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources as pieces of concern because of roads, right? Because of road mortality. So, uh, you know, this is kind of a nice, a good story, you know, because as of, you know, so far has a happy ending, nobody died, <laughs> right? In the, pro in the making of this story, <laughs> in the making of this movie. But, uh, you know, the, the truth of the matter is that there are, you know, they, there, there are a lot of turtles that do get killed and hit on the roads, right? So the goal of, you know, the goal of this project was to actually come up with some, you know, to really understand how they behave in proximity to roads and then maybe design, you know, go to Ohio Department of Transportation and try to figure out ways to mitigate those roads, like design some sort of like underpasses or culverts or well, some sort of other uh, um, ways to, you know, uh, decrease or eliminate road mortality altogether. So that's the end goal, you know, and, 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 and as you'll see, it's, it, again, it's a recurring team. You know, usually the, this is the nice end goal, whether you get there, <laughs> you know, or, or whether your solution actually takes you to the end goal. That's a different story, right? Um, yes. yes. Right, right. Other little roads, they just didn't want to deal with the bypass. Right, and uh, right. So the question, is, the question is, uh, you know, turtles cross other roads, like smaller roads, you know, and why do they do that versus, you know, versus the bypass? And this is actually, I mean, this is a, this is the question that we're trying to, to answer as well, is because. Uh, you know, you see, you see turtles on roads all the time, right? They're just kind of sitting there, like sunning themselves in the morning, uh, especially like if you go in Wayne or Zaleski, they're pretty much everywhere, right? But somehow this big road, these big roads, you know, really kind of act as a barrier, right? So, you know, and from one point of view, it's good that they're not crossing this road, but in the long run, you know, populations become isolated because there's no exchange, right, of genes between you know, different sides of the roads. And the really cool project would be to actually go, so Ohio, by the way, it's the, Ohio has the third largest Department of Transportation and one of the highest densities of roads in the United States. They're very proud of it. <laughs> um, so some really interesting spin-offs would be to actually go and sample where we had really old roads, you know, like all these big highways, like 71, 77, or whatever highways, and really try to look at like the genetic makeup of populations his, like historically, to see if indeed, like, is this, you know, now you have like, you know, looks like a widespread species, but now maybe just like a piecemeal kind of, um, you know, population wise. Very good question. Thanks. Yes. Great question. Um, so Marcel can tell you a lot more about it because uh, she did all the, all the work, but uh, she's been using this really neat. Um, a new technique of looking at court level, so stress hormone level, uh, from nails. So uh, usually people look at, you know, scientists look at, at stress level, uh, at, um, looking at court, court level in blood, but that gives you just like the, the previous like five minutes, like because you caught the animal is stressed out. Uh, with, with nails, uh, because nails, you know, have blood cells, that bl blood vessels that go all the way, so the court is deposited in the keratin, and as the nails grow, grow longer and we, and we think maybe about is it six months so we, we uh, so marcel clipped about two millimeters one to two millimeters of the nails uh in the, on the front on the front legs so that gives us about stress level for the previous six months which is really really cool and we still need data for that but we see that females are a lot more stressed out than males it's pro it was probably because they i mean one of the cases one of the uh, explanations could be just because they and they have to go and find the nesting site, and you know they're a lot more stressed out after, after mating season. Males are kind of like, see you later, uh, doing their own thing. Um, but uh, with some more sampling, uh, we think there might be some sort of signal of the highway, but we cannot just say that for sure. And that, yeah, there's not a question here. Yeah, you said that it was bad that they weren't allowed to cross the roads after right. a while, but wouldn't that? an increase in biodiversity? Like wouldn't the two separate populations eventually end up becoming different? In Become totally, well, that's probably, oh no, that's a great question. So if whether, you know, by impeding the turtles to cr like crossing the roads, 
uh, you would increase diversity, like genetic diversity, because you know populations will kind of go their own way. Um, it depends. It's, it really it's one of those like depends. <laughs> uh, you know, if the population is small enough on one side of the road, it, they can actually you know it, like the inbreeding can occur, all sort of all sort of other genetic problems. Uh, so it's not usually it's much from a population standpoint, it's much better to have dispersal and movement of animals around, around the landscape uh, just to maintain this like biodiver rich biodiversity. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. I guess I didn't repeat. Okay, I will repeat the questions. I promise. <clears throat> okay. I'll be back if you don't. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, awesome. Uh, okay, let's move on. Marcel is there to ask some more questions about turtles. Okay. He's got an awesome hat. Okay. All right, so uh, Cassie Thompson, uh, ma master student and proud re recipient of an NSF graduate fellowship. Uh, she. Uh, yay. Uh, right, she was interested, she uh, loves herbs, and she was interested in, in climate change and like thermal ecology of, of, of herbs, of, of amphibians. So she set up to put together a huge project. <laughs> so basically asking, you know, how will frogs basically cope with climate change? And from, um, she, what she's looking at, it's from a, uh, from a, a hydro period. So hydro period is the, it's how fast a pond dries. Right, so these are wood frogs right there, and they live in temporary pools. So if the, if the pool's dry before the tadpoles metamorphose, right, uh, population is gone, or that year's recruitment is gone. So she set up to do these crazy experiments. Right? So, that one, so the previous study was like observational. This one is purely experimental. So we have 40 big cattle tanks in a secret location. Uh, and she... Uh, put tadpoles in these cattle tanks, they're by, like big like 1,000 liter, 1, liter tanks, and then she started drying, like drawing the water down. So she had some that she didn't draw the water down at all, and some of them that was really fast. And the outcome was this, right? So when you raise the frog in a non-drying pond, they pretty much grew big, happy, you know, swam around until they, their heart desire. Um, when you, when the pond was drying fast, uh, not only about half of them died because they didn't have, didn't, didn't metamorphose in time, but they came out with a much smaller size. So these are basically siblings, right? They're like brothers, sisters, whatever. Uh, but this one came out about maybe two weeks later than this, this guy out of the pool, right? So, so this guy, you know, it's like negatives and positives too. Like, you know, not everybody died. <laughs> some, you know, some, some came out and it's, you know, this tells us that, you know, these animals are really plastic, right? So they are, br they are bred, <laughs> they are selected for, for variation, for variability, right? I mean, that's why they breed in temporary pools, right? So the cool thing is that you know, she found this thing and then she went a few steps further than any other study to date to take these animals and then put them in these enclosures in the woods, right? And really follow, you know, the, the idea was that, that uh, people had is that, well, if you come out small, you're going to die, you know, you might as well just not come out. You know, like, it's bad news. So what we found is that um, if you go out, if, you know, if you put them out in good conditions in woods, you know, with nice leaf litter and food and stuff, there was no difference in survival between this and this, these guys, right? So that was kind of a good news, right? So it's, uh, you know, and it, in some ways it makes sense. You know, nature really set them up to do this. I mean, why would they come out of the pool if they're going to die <laughs> later on, right? So... Um, and she's continuing, she's doing more, a whole bunch more experiments this year to figure out, you know, how far they jump, what's their locomotor performance, and what's their endurance, and playing with frogs, basically, for a career. It's kind of cool, huh? Um, all right. And then she wants to take all that, so that was the first thing. But then she wants to take all this information and do these predictions across the Midwest and say, where in the future ponds will dry faster, uh, and then, in those cases, maybe do have some population impacts across this huge, huge geographic scales. So good luck with that. <laughs> I'll be here. Yes? Okay, so if they both have similar survival rates, are there mm -hmm. any like, really big disadvantages of being a smaller species for, like, the, the, for the drying ones? The drying ones? So, uh, so, so far, so we follow them for about... Oh, ah! All right. <laughs> 
So if they survive the same, are there disadvantages of coming out small? Right? And we don't know actually yet. This is a, it's a great question, right? So for the period that we followed them, which is about a month and a half, uh, they seem to be fine. But whether what we call this carryover effects, right, from the aquatic to the terrestrial habitat, uh, if now, for example, overwintering might have an effect, right? So, uh, but we weren't able to follow them that much. So that's one of the goals to be able to create like better conditions in this enclosure so they can actually follow them for a lot, for a lot longer. Um, they might have, there might be other issues uh, later, later in life when they grow, when they get to be a, adults, right? Because if, we, if we're a smaller female, we don't produce as many eggs. So then, you know, the population repercussions could be a lot bigger than just, you know, this is a piece of good news, but then the full story, you know, we're still, you know, a bit, a bit away from uh, figuring that out. Morgan? Yeah. So I was just wondering, is a small frog always going to be small? Like, is there no way then if the habitat's really good mm -hmm. when they go into the forest, <coughs> if somehow can play catch up? Catch up. So that was one of our hypotheses. That's great. That's a great question. So uh, it, whether, you know, do, this, do the small frogs are able to play catch up? Yes, the question. So that was the question. Whether the small frogs can play catch up and grow as big as the, as, the, as, the, as the large frogs. So what we found is that they did not catch up, but the growth rate was the same. So we're not, so they grew, um, they grew similarly to the large frogs, but they never caught up within this period of time. So uh, we think that probably they will never be as, as, as large, right? Okay, but that's just my personal opinion. We'll see. <laughs> okay, uh, there, sorry. Um, I know that this is relating to climate change. Yeah. How can this relate, or can it relate to um, tadpoles and such that are um, in vernal pools? Right. So, they are, so, okay, so, so the conditions, the ex experimental conditions that Cassie manipulated, they mimic vernal pool conditions. Oh, okay. Right, so they're like, you know, faster drying or... Right. Good question. So... What they mimic, do they mimic, oh my God, do they mimic, uh, right, the question was that whether, um, you know, this applies to vernal pool conditions, and they do, they do because they mimic. Okay. Um, any other questions, or I can move on to the next? Okay, you guys want bobcat pictures, huh? Okay. Um, all right, so I'm not going to talk too much about this, because my student, Matt, which is not here, damn it. Um, uh, he just started this project, right? So for this, we're actually working with Ohio Department of Natural Resources, uh, Ohio, the hellbenders, you know, the largest salamander in North America. It's like a two-foot salamander. How, how many of you knew that this existed in Ohio? Okay, not everybody. Okay. <clears throat> All right. It's pretty amazing. It's, it's scary sometimes if you look at it. Uh, but it's in danger. No, it's, it's, a, it's a biological indicator of stream health, right? So it only lives in, like, really clean beautiful streams, which if you go in Southeast Ohio, don't find too many of those, right? They're just uh, pretty rare. And because of that, because of uh, acid mine drainage, sedimentation, pollution, whatever we did to the, to the land in the past 150 years or more, uh, there's only a few remnant populations in Ohio, and Ohio DNR has been really active, uh, reintroducing them. So they go take eggs from the wild, whatever they find them. They rear them in captivity at Columbus Zoo and some other places, and then they release them back. So they, they rear them to about three years old, and they put them back in streams, right? So this kind of this, this is one of those, um, somebody said zoo, right? So this is where conservation ex situ, meaning like, you know, outside the actual natural area, it becomes very important. Um, so they've been doing this for a few years, adding you know, augmenting populations of hellbenders in Ohio. Uh, and, my, and Matt, he's going to basically kind of jump into this effort already and really look at some of the issues around reproductive uh, ecology. They're fascinating animals. The, 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 dad, the father sits, stays with the eggs for until the eggs hatch, and they do all these cool things like they fan the eggs to get them, give them oxygen. Uh, if any eggs fail, they eat, they, they remove them so it doesn't contaminate the rest of the clutch. It's pretty amazing. Um, <laughs> so, so he's going to uh, start field work this summer. Uh, they're also called snot otters or lasagna, lasagna lizards. Uh, and there was a cool NPR uh, 
uh, clip from last year about the introduction of Hellbenders in Ohio. You, can, you guys can check it out. Uh, so this is with uh, uh, the, the person spearheading this. His name is Greg Lips. He works for OSU, and he's really uh, he's a really great collaborator. And uh, Matt is going to is trying to answer some of these more basic basic ecological questions about learning about hellbenders. And then, in the hopes of really you know uh, you know trying to help all these efforts in in the state by like mon monitoring them properly. Uh, Maybe get into some issues related to fracking. Just putting it out there, but we're not sure how that's how far how you know if uh, if it's a too far of a reach for just a P for just a PhD project. All right, so uh, so it, there's no results here. We're just working on these nest boxes right now. So this is big, about 50 pounds, probably more 50 pounds. I don't know. These big concrete boxes that uh, Ohio DNR has been putting in streams. To, um, to, uh, to increase reproductive habitat. So there's not too many, so they breed under these huge rocks and there's not too many rocks in the streams apparently in Ohio anymore. And now they're putting these big boxes where the animals can come in and go into this like little tunnel and then they can just nest, nest in there. So Matt is gonna develop some new technology, we'll see what, oops, uh, to, um, uh, to monitor these nest boxes. So it be, should be kind of cool, so keep up, keep, you know, Tuned. We'll, we'll put some stories on the forum. Usually. Okay. So uh, I think we're gonna might be getting. What time is it? No o'clock. Thirty-five. Okay, bobcats. All right. So, um, quick question about hellbenders. I don't. Yes. Yes. The question is, do I look for un do I look for undergrad volunteers? <laughs> yes. Uh, and there are. We always on the lookout for uh, field. Uh, you know, for people that are really interested in doing field work. Uh, have my email. <laughs> I'm in Irvine four two three. Yes. Just click, it for me? click. This. Next slide, yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, all right, something happened. Um, so yes, uh, if you're interested in volunteering, participating in, in any of these projects, you're more than welcome to. I think I've been, I, I mean, I didn't even count how many undergrads have been going through the lab in the past two years, and uh, some of them are here. <laughs> Connor and Ryan, and okay. Okay. Um, okay, bobcats. All right, let's talk about bobcats. All right, bobcats. Well, I was talking about bears, but I'm going to move on from bears. There's a whole, there's a new science cafe there. Yeah. Right. So, the secret lives of bobcats. <laughs> Not those bobcats, right? Okay. Uh, actually, these guys, right? So, this is a, a four-year now, uh, well, it will be a four-year effort and collaboration with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Um, Heidi Benson here, she's the lead uh, grad student for this project right now. So we work very closely with Way National Forest, uh, with the state of Ohio in general, to really, really understand the dynamics of the population, of the Ohio bobcat population, right? So this is a new thing, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. So bobcats are one of those species that are like pretty much everywhere in North America. I mean, look at the map, it's just like a blob. It's like everywhere, right? Except for this hole in, hole in like Midwest, right? So in Ohio, studying bobcats is super interesting because you're actually witnessing a real-time recovery of the species, like, like right now, <laughs> right? So it's, uh, so it's time-sensitive, and it's interesting because it's, not, it's a system that's like nowhere else in North America, right? So the secret lights of the real Ohio bobcats. Um, I, want, I do have a question for you before we go move on. Uh, you guys are Ohio Bobcats, so uh, does anyone know when did the Bobcat become the mascot of Ohio University? I mean, you know, Bobcats, definitely better mascot than, you know, let's say, Bacchus. <laughs> right. So I'll tell you. So it's very interesting. So in 1925, 
the university put out a, a, a there was a contest of like who comes up with a, with a mascot like with some you know some symbol for the Ohio University, and some student won ten dollars, which was the prize, <laughs> and he came up with a bobcat right with a mighty bobcat the pride of Appalachia. Now the interesting thing was that in 1925 there were zero bobcats in Ohio. Okay, and 1960s when uh, the mascot Ruf, Ruf, Rufus was actually like it was a football game and he came up on the field and all that kind of stuff. So not 1960. Well, it turns out that 19, 1960 is the first ever verified sighting of a bobcat in Ohio, and it was actually shot. Okay, uh, somewhere in Hocking County. Okay, so. Uh, so the history of bobcats is very interesting, right? So bobcats have been extirpated from Ohio in 1850 because of trapping, hunting, you know, we pretty much cut all the forest. I mean, they, we did everything that we shouldn't have done to the land, right? Uh, and only in 19, early, like, you know, probably 1950s, 100 years later, they started coming back. And they're coming back from, uh, <clears throat> from West Virginia, and they're coming back, so from West Virginia, I guess, and from Kentucky, right? So now we know for sure there's been studies by Ohio DNR that there are two distinct populations. So one that has the genetic makeup of the Kentucky bobcats and one that has the genetic makeup of the West Virginia bobcats, right? And the two populations are, are meeting somewhere basically around Athens, right? So it's kind of, it's a, we're in a very really strategic position to, do, to, to study bobcats. So, uh, so the story behind, the, behind this project is that, uh, you know, Ohio DNR really wanted to know more about the population in the state. You know, how is the population doing? We know they're expanding, but at what rate? What's the population growth? How many bobcats are there? You know, there are a lot of interests around bobcats. People love bobcats uh, for various reasons. Um, so, uh, so basically, we, uh, we were awarded a, a grant to actually look at, to, to explore this exact thing, you know, like trying to come up with a population model. Right. A model that will tell us the population is growing at this rate, or at this rate, or at this rate, or what else. So then, so we can actually predict what the future of the bobcat is going to be in, in, in Ohio. And in the process, we need to learn more about how many bobcats are there, what's their interaction with coyotes, for example, which are not a native species for Ohio. Right? So about 50 years ago, or 70 years ago, there was no coyotes in Ohio. Right, so it's an invasive species. So how are they coping with this, with, with this kind of stuff? Uh, and, he and Heidi here, she started a uh, crazy <laughs> field, pro field study this summer, and Connor was a huge part of it, uh, all the way from the AEP land, uh, the, what is it, the, the recreation lands, you know, somewhere around Cambridge, you know, if you know where the wilds are, all this like land that's kind of like empty, old, old uh, mine land. Uh, and then way in National Forest, Aleski, and she put a bazillion camera traps out there to figure out where bobcats are, right? So it's not just pretty pictures, we can actually apply statistical models to figure out what, you know, why the bobcats are in some spots and why they're not in other spots, right? So it's not just pretty pictures, although they're really pretty, <laughs> right? Uh, that, right? So if you go back here, what, also what she did here, we're trying to get genetic material from these bobcats, right? So we're trying to get hair. And like getting hair from a cat is like, you know, herding cats, right? It's not easy. It's like getting, sorry, getting hair to do genetic analysis and identify individuals. It's a very common method in, in my field. But it's mostly done with like dumb bears that kind of go underneath this like barbed wire and leave hair there. Well, to get cats, to get hair from cats, we had to be really smarter than cats, maybe. <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> we were. So what we did, we put this really stinky lure, which that was my only prop I wanted to bring today. But I thought I would really kick everybody out of the cafe, so I didn't do that. Uh, it smells like skunk butt, basically. <laughs> uh, but, the cat, but the cats love it. And so what we did, she put, so these are like some, um, some little saw blades and some uh, sticky like traps, and then the bobcats kind of robbed all over the place, right? They did this, they did all this crazy stuff in front of the camera. That's why it has the secret life of the bo high bobcats. Uh, also found the bear. This is another cool thing. Like bears are gone. They're not. They're, you know, there's no bear population in Ohio, but they're coming from West Virginia. So we found one in one instance 
There was a bear on the camera, so you can't really see his face, but he was there. It's kind of cool. Um, also, there's like coyotes love the lure as well. <laughs> this guy spent about four hours <laughs> <laughs> just uh, doing all sort of stuff, taking a nap, you know, rolling, and you know, you know, happy animals in Ohio. I should make a series of that. Um, so, like, yeah, so yeah, so he's doing this forever and never, never. So this is Heidi here, and she went and went back every other week, every 10 days, with, uh, uh, had two field crews out there, uh, and she got hair. So there's like all these little hairs on the, you know, on, the stra on the straps, and then now she's analyzing the data. She's basically doing all the genetics, and then what we're going to try to figure out is like, which hair comes from what bobcat and where that bobcat was trapped. And then we can actually plug all this data into a fancy statistical model to come up with a number of like, they are between 50 and 150 bobcats, or hopefully narrower, <laughs> you know, in this area, right? so, which is something that DNR really wants to know. Uh, so that was crazy intense field, uh, field season that lasted about six months, I think. Uh, we started taking the traps out in November, only to find out that, well, yeah, there's another bobcat. This is what they do next to that lure. It's kind of crazy. Um, I mean, they're cats, right? Cat's a cat's a cat. Um, so they do that. They do that as well. Right? And they do leave a lot of hair in the process. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, oh, there's another one. Right? This guy is really doing the cat stuff. So that guy, if you look at the time here, I mean, they're just hanging out there for a while, which is cool. Uh, but then in November, or actually about in, in October, we started, oh, there's not one, sorry. Well, no, this is a kitten. Yay, that's what I wanted to get. So, yay, <laughs> I know the reaction. I have the same reaction if I watch this like a bazillion times. Um, so what we started finding, it's the, bob, the kittens coming out. So over the summer, they were small, they live in trees. Uh, the moms don't really take them out. By August, September, the moms started like showing them the territory. Maybe started showing how to you know how to hunt. So this was in October. Okay. Um, this is a really fresh one. So this is in August, right? This is really the smallest bob kitten that we actually found uh, right. <laughs> on the <laughs> on the cameras. You know, another super cute one. So they love this, the lure. Same, just just the same. So that's October. That's another another like they're getting you know slightly bigger and they're getting more adventurous. The parents retake really them out, uh, and this is really we realized that this was a really critical piece of data, <laughs> which was an afterthought because we took all the cameras out. This crazy effort to take everything out that we put in was like our field season is done, and then we're like, oh damn, this is the most important information because breeding and reproduction and survival of bob of kittens is what actually drives everything. Right, drives the expansion of cats, drives everything, right? So then Devon here, with some, a couple of other field techs, they went back out <laughs> and put them back, right? Uh, well, you know, with some gas money, but that's okay. So we're getting, now we're still getting all these cats, right? So there's another, you know, the cat and the, the kitten and the mom, and then this is the same one, like the kitten comes in, plays around as well. Okay, let me see, go on this side a little bit. Um, so, um, probably peed there or something. Um, they do that. That's actually a really good source of DNA if you can get it. Um, and then this is the cool thing. It's what we found. It was like, oh, there's a little bob, there's a bob kitten on the, on the camera. There's another bob kitten on the camera. And another. Okay, and the mom, right? So this was the only instance where we actually found three, like a, a litter of three bobcats, which means that they're really doing really good, <laughs> you know? I mean, it was a good year. Remember, last year was a cicada year, which means tons of animals, tons of prey. So then, you know, with a, with a one-year delay, it, there's a ton of food this year. So whether there's going to be this many bobcats next year remains to be seen, All right? Um, I think that's what I had, actually. Excellent. Then your timing is perfect. 
Awesome. All right. I'm inviting questions about Bobcats then. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, what's in these lures that make them like, okay. so attractive and why do they like, go okay. crazy? So what's, the question is, what's in the lures? Eh? I <laughs> learned things. <laughs> uh, what's in the lures? So we know for sure that there's skunk. Uh, it, the, the lure is proprietary, like we buy it. It's like a trapping trap lure. So we buy it from a company and it's proprietary. They don't, I mean, I don't want to, it's one of those like dirty jobs. Like I don't want to, I don't want to work in that factory, <laughs> basically. Uh, but one thing that we noticed is that at minus 20, whatever it was, cold, it did not freeze. So <laughs> we don't know what's in it. <laughs> right, it's kind of scary, yes. Great, great question. So the question is, when we do the DNA, do we treat each strand as a different sample? And the, the, the answer is no. So we take, so that's why we go there every 10 days or every, or more often if possible. Um, and even if there, if there are two animals that robbed, that kind of messes the data as well. Uh, so we just basically take, you know, usually the, the, the sample is such a mess that all this glue just like with bugs, with stuff stuck on there that we just take that and kind of try to get the, the follicles, you know, the bottom of the base of the hair. And, and Heidi's doing that right now at the wilds, with our collaborators at the wilds. Yes? Are you yeah. finding that the same cats that are hanging around the same areas, or is there a lot of movement within that? Uh, so the question is whether there are the same cats in the same areas, or, or if there's movement. Um, and I'd love to know that as well, actually. Uh, it's very tough. So the DNA will tell us, will tell us that. So it's very tough to ident ID them um, from their spots. It's been all sort of efforts to try to figure out and just from a camera, you know, it's Bobcat, Joe or Jim or whatever. Uh, sometimes you can tell them because, you know, sometimes they're, they're sub-adults and they're like super skinny. And some of them, they're like really nice, big, big animals. Uh, and also we spaced the cameras. So there was some forethought <laughs> going into how we put the cameras. They were spaced in a way that... Um, there was one camera per average home range. So we had some data from before, from ODNR, saying like, you know, the, an average home range for a female is this many square kilometers. So we kind of put a grid on top of all Ohio <laughs> and started to choose, of, of that size. And then we started to choose, hey, put a camera here, 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 here. So they shouldn't be, but we don't know. Yes? So because you, put, uh, you guys saw all those babies, like, does that mean that the bobcat population is doing at the first, uh, sorry, oh, man, God, it's getting so late. Uh, the, the question was that are whether we see this so, so many so many kittens uh, that the population is doing really well. Um, well, so that's what we're trying. That's what we're trying to answer. We, so because we see all this evidence of reproduction, we're very optimistic about it. That is actually doing good. Um, I just had a conversation today with uh, uh, somebody at Ohio DNR, and they. For just this year alone, they had, 500, they had 500 verified sightings. So basically, they welcome whenever somebody sees a bobcat or gets, and everybody has a trail camera in their backyard nowadays. And if, they, if you get a bobcat, you send it, hey, hey, you know, this is where I caught it. So it seems like they are, you know. And what he told me is that they got some, like I didn't tell you that yet, <laughs> is that they got um, animals in this, like, in the middle of these fields, right? So, so far, we think that kind of southeast, like the forested part of Ohio, it's what, where the bobcats are. No, they got animals in the middle of mm, corn, nowhere, <laughs> Ohio, really. So if there's a patch of forest, if they can actually, you know, move. I mean, we saw that they can, they kind of move through everywhere. You know, they move, you know, there's a, some, we're doing some sort of like roadkill and road uh, crossing analysis and they don't care. They move through a lot of uh, types of landscapes and especially some of the, like forest roads are probably useful to like, you know, there are corridors for dispersal. So they're, I think they're doing really good. Uh, Morgan. So you mentioned like the size of the home range. Yes. But are there particular elements that bobcats like to have in their home range? So are there things that, you know, they might have a smaller home mm -hmm. range because they have like everything mm -hmm. that they need there and larger ones. And right. could you just elaborate on <laughs> yeah. what kind of habitat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the question is, uh, do all bobcats have the same, or if there's any attributes or any characteristics of, to that home range that makes it 
a home range. You know, if there's anything specific that Bobcats like. Uh, <clears throat> and this is not our work, this is work from Ohio DNR, but they found that the, let's say Ohio, so the, e like the, the eastern bobcats, so the ones that are from the, can, from the West Virginia population, have much, much smaller home ranges than, uh, than the southern bobcats that are in more forested areas. And the, re and the reason is that those, those guys from eastern, eastern Ohio have access to a lot more pasture, open areas, uh, actually former mines that were reclaimed. So uh, I told you about, so I told you the AEP recreation lands, just Google that, there's like a 60,000 acres of formerly uh, open, open, open mine that's been re uh, remediated, right? So now there's all this like crazy landscape, looks like, looks like a savanna. <laughs> so because they have all these open spaces, there's a lot of rodents, there's a lot of voles, there's a lot of other, all sort of other rodents. And actually they have some much more smaller home ranges in those areas because they have a ton more food, a lot more abundant. And the guys in, down in Wayne or Zaleski or all down in Shawnee, because it's all compact forest, most of it, they really have to expand their range to get their, to get their resources. So, and ODNR also has uh, a, some work in progress right now using some of their, some telemetry data. So, so basically all these points, all these locations where bobcats have been, have been found to actually evaluate the structure, like, you know, what kind of habitat? Is it forest with this, forest with that? So hopefully soon we'll get that answer. Um, yes, Roxanne? Are there any bobcats around Athens, Ohio? Question is whether there are bobcats around Athens, Athens Ohio. Uh, yes. <laughs> Simple question is yes. They, uh, there are, and uh, actually I get, I get images from around, I mean, we have pictures in Athens. There's a bobcat that really likes to hang out around the font barn. So we saw, we know for sure it was the same bobcat. We had cameras on both sides of the highway. So we saw it on both sides, <laughs> right at the font barn. Uh, also got a picture, uh, a picture from a uh, student of mine that was uh, uh, somebody, like one of his friends sent it to him of a bobcat taking down a deer, which was amazing. Okay, so there's, yeah, there's tons of bobcats. Yes. Is that considered unusual, like in terms of how many kittens they have at once? Like, what's the typical? Mm -hmm. So the question is whether three kittens are. It's it's usual to have three kittens. Is usual, and I would say that this is on the higher end. So usually, uh, usually, uh, you know, two kittens probably it's 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 the average. It really depends whether they whether the kittens get to that age where they're like this big, right? It really depends on the food resources of that year. So like, you know, a mom could actually have a four kittens litter, right? But if she cannot feed them all because there are not enough resources that year, then maybe only one of them would get to, to be an adult. But in this case, I, with, I mean, this is, a, this is an awkward, this is an odd year just because we had the cicada year last year. So everything is kind of out of, uh, you know. Um, so we'll see, maybe, so it's important to keep this thing going. So to see maybe do we ever do we see three bob kittens three kittens for a mom next year? We'll see. But yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yes. Right, uh, have you been able to track um, like interbreeding between Kentucky and West Virginia versions of podcasts? Can you repeat that? Interbreeding. Um, have you been able to um, track interbreeding between the West Virginia and Kentucky versions? Uh, so the question is whether there was <coughs> if we're able to f uh, to to track breeding between the, the two subpopulations, between the West Virginia and the Kentucky yeah. populations. And uh, the, the answer is that we, we, not yet, we don't know yet. So uh, the study that identified these two um, the subpopulations came from roadkill. So Ohio, DO, Ohio DNR, uh, their wildlife officer used to collect all the roadkill. There's a lot of bobcat roadkill, by the way. Um, and that was a good source of, of genetic material. And they saw, I mean, they probably, they probably, so this was a study using data up to 2012 or 2013. Uh, and they're basically, I mean, they were like right, they basically um, you know, overlapping almost. So at the rate of expansion, which we think is pretty fast right now, uh, I have no doubt that there is, you know, it'd be really nice to follow up. Hopefully not with roadkill. <laughs> um, Last question. Oh. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Blake. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, uh, yes. Uh, like, would catnip make good bait? 
Uh, question is whether catnip would make good bait. Um, as, I can tell you it's not as good as what we use. Uh, ODN, ODNR used catnip, so this kind of, you know, this is what people used to use, like catnip, uh, valerian, uh, and they're not, not that interested. I mean, they come and sniff it, but nothing like this. This is just crazy. <laughs> so I guess, so what, one last thing, luck plays a huge part <laughs> of, this, of this research, right? So if those cats didn't react to this lure, would have had a lot less data and a lot less cool pictures, right? So luck has to be on your side. Okay, we can, okay, we can ask. Sorry. Okay, there's one more question. So, in general, it seems that the population of people in Appalachia has declined over the past several years. Do you think that has anything to do with an incline of bobcat population? So, the question is uh, whether the declining population in Appalachia uh, has something to do with the increase in, in the bobcat population. That is actually a great question, and I, I don't think we ever thought about that at, until now, actually. Uh, so I will <laughs> have to put that back, <laughs> put that on a, uh, on a future ideas. But uh, I think it might be a combination of the, really the, the forest really coming back and getting older and maybe less, less human impact, although I wonder whether the, you know, the roads and cars and all this stuff kind of may, may offset the decrease in population. I mean, they don't really, you know, people, people have seen and had their camera traps in their backyards. They don't really shy. You know, they don't really avoid people. Um, so whether, you know, they're taking advantage of people not being there. But I'll be, I think we might actually have the data to actually look at that. So thanks. Okay, Thank guys, you. next week is a cafe <coughs> conversation, and the week after that is another science cafe. This is where you should be on Wednesdays at 5 o'clock. That's right. Period, right? <laughs> and I'm sure he would be <coughs> Right, free coffee. And I'm sure he'll be happy to talk to any of you or answer any more questions. You can just come up afterwards. Thank you very yeah. much, guys. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't get all the questions. <laughs>